Well, you can tell us all about it on a future Wood Turner's Weekly Coffee Hour because it's 10 o'clock <laughs> and that's what this is. And so if you thought you were going to something else this morning, you've made a mistake. It's You're about to waste a while away a perfectly good hour here, as the Car Talks guys used to say, talking about wood turning. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. Saturday morning is uh, our regular, uh, now regular monthly open shop at Kaufman Kitchens, nine to one, four hours. Uh, there are four lathes there and we're slowly getting them all equipped to be turning stations. So you can come and talk, you can come and sh do something, you can teach somebody, you can learn something, you can ask questions, you can stand around and drink coffee. Uh, all, all available in person, no Zoom component. So that's one benefit of membership in Lancaster Wood Turners. There's a monthly club meeting every uh, first Tuesday of every month. Um, that's a hybrid event, so you can attend in person or you can attend on Zoom. And of course, there is uh, the weekly coffee hour, which is uh, every week. So there's 50 of those in a year, roughly. Um, and you can come to this whether you belong to Lancaster Wood Turners or not. Uh, but we do, of course, invite you to join the club if you'd like. Um, so those are the three principal benefits of membership in the club, and you get access to all these amazing wood turners to ask them questions and show off your work. Um, so I hope to see some of you anyhow on Saturday morning. Um, and let me see, what else did I want to say? I want, since I was talking a couple of weeks ago about my own stuff, I'm going to just uh, indulge that for another moment here uh, with a spotlight. Um, you know, I was making these you wood bowls. Um, and I was complaining about my uh, sanding abilities and you guys gave me a talking to and as you can see here, this is perfectly sanded. Uh, and what I've discovered, I went down to the shop and found that I hadn't been turning in about a year for health reasons and you know it's what happens when you get old. And I completely forgot that I had bought one of these about a year ago. This is a Ryobi, you know, a Rikon little two inch battery powered sander. Um, and the, the, it has a threaded fitting here, and I haven't been able to quite figure out how to get more stuff to fit on it, but, but that's okay. It's a 10 millimeter thread, and I'm sure these things exist with a 10 millimeter thread. Uh, and I've been using this thing to do my final sanding, and Bruce gave me the ultimate clue that I needed, which was turn the lathe off, sand with the lathe station, with the sand the workpiece where it needs sanding. Uh, duh. I hadn't figured that out before because I'd never used the power sanding equipment before either. I always thought you had a certain sand. I was in raised in the old days, you know, you sand by hand and work goes around and then you pause and scrub away at it for a bit. So thank you all. I got straightened out and on sanding and I learned how I what I have to do to make stuff that doesn't have scratches, which hadn't really been something I'd paid much attention to before. So that's another benefit of coffee hour. Um, so that's my speech for the morning. Um, it is open uh, open call this morning. I know that Kai has a slideshow about tool handles that he uh, would like to present, which I'm keen to see. Uh, who else uh, has things they want to show or announcements you want to make or things you want the group to know about or show to the group? Use raise hand. We'll get you in a queue and we'll go down the queue in order, uh, roughly. I'm going to start with, I know that Ernie has some stuff. We I asked him to bring up uh, photographs of, uh, what is it, coring systems? Hollowing systems. Hollowing systems. You want to go to that? Should we do that first? Sure. Okay. I'm going to put the spotlight on you. Most of these photos are from uh, the first or the third edition of the lathe book. However, this I did for a new product review, of, I think about a year and a half, two years ago. This is probably the cheapest hollowing rig on the market is from Sorby. And I think they call it a Steady Pro. And uh, it's just a simple set of uh, rollers in which you can put Sorby's hollowing tools in or scraping tools really. And they build a whole assortment of inserts for them in both high-speed steel and uh, carbide. And you can also turn this whole mechanism to several stops on that to uh, make them the equivalent uh, of a uh, negative rake scraper. But uh, you adjust the height with a tool, to, with a banjo, with where you put it in the banjo. It's very simple. Somebody wanting to try this, I think it's a pretty good value. Does it work pretty good? Yeah, it does. It works surprisingly well. Wouldn't you have it closer to the workpiece in the in the real world here? I, indubitably. Uh, I did this mostly to show off its reach. Okay. So the, um, the you can adjust the gap. It looks to me like rotating the mechanism a little bit so that the gap 
the, the between the rollers ch changes yeah um that particular s sorby boring bar has a flat spot on the bottom which keeps okay. it from turning but essentially once you get the center height right by keeping upward pressure on the handle it won't rotate okay uh, so it, it's it's a pretty decent rig and i i don't i think they're like 150 bucks maybe uh I, I don't know what the current price is but it's it worked well nice find i never saw that one before now this is the one-way system which probably knowing one way is the most expensive one you could buy uh, but it works as advertised, uh, and uh, this also has uh, their bowl steady on it right here, which would put a little pressure to the side on bowls or hollow forms. It's more for hollow forms than bowls, but it uh, does help to steady that and take the vibration out of internal cuts. That's a lot of apparatus. That's like a gate back here, this white thing, right? exactly it's a big big gate so you have a lot of lever arm there so you can really go deep with that yeah and then you adjust your tool rest or your tool wrist as your you know, second steady on this and so you're i usually put a level on the bar and adjust it around between the gate and the other thing until i have the whole bar dead level on the center line this also has the uh, uh, laser attachment above that allows you to control wall thickness very accurately. Hey, Ernie, doesn't it, it seems like the bolt steady should be on the other side? Am I missing something, or are you turning the other way? No, I'm turning uh, the correct way, but it uh, you can put it on either side. It really doesn't matter, uh, but it. Uh, uh, but most of your steady rests are really just stressing the piece in one direction so it won't move around. Uh, I'm just thinking the pressure you're putting on is in the, op in the opposite direction. I would think you would want the steady rest to counter that if you could. No, because no. that's freshly turned. It's perfectly round now. And uh, uh, that will take the, uh, the chatter out of it or reduce the amount of chatter. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can play around this and put it whichever side you want, but it's basically built to be on the right side of the bowl as you're looking at it. Uh, and uh, steady rests work because they mostly deflect the piece slightly and keep it from chattering. Well, it, seem, it seems to me in, the, in that situation, you, all you really need is a lower wheel. Well, probably. Uh, again, this stuff comes in. I try to photograph it as the uh, directions uh, direct. Uh, but uh, I, I found it to be a useful device. I, I have two of their uh, spindle turning steady rests, which are the best in the business as far as I'm concerned. Who is this from? Uh, so this is from One Way. The One Way system. Yeah. Yeah. And here you can see I've set the laser so that the little dot on my uh, forefinger of my left hand there is is just, you know, about like an eighth of an inch from the edge of the cutter so that you can perfectly control the wall thickness. And as long as the laser line would be over here on the uh, turning, you would be uh, able to remove material the minute it drops off the edge you've re re reached the thickness you desire there you can see with the red dot is right there i'm going to try and enlarge that at least on my own screen yeah there it is on it. And, uh, so you find that better than the camera system that people use you were talking to me about that the other day i think it's infinitely better because cameras I don't know what are you seeing in there you're not really seeing wall thickness you're seeing what's happening but uh, i think that uh this is pretty much proof proof positive uh if you remember sorby years ago made a uh a parting tool which had like a 
gizmo that came off around to the other side and you could set it to make uh, tenons of definite size. And this but, works on the same principle. That's an old tool, that hood, uh, the tenon uh, with the, the tenon or with the gat with the uh, sizing gauge on it. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's been around since you and I started turning it. Before that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, how expensive is that one way system? Uh, it's a lot. I don't know what the current price is, but yeah. you're probably looking at a couple grand by the time you're through. And it only fits on a one way lathe from the look of it. No, you can fit them on others. And one way is quite gracious about uh, building for any size. Uh, I have uh, one of their banjos on one of my Powermatics because uh, to me, the one way banjo is the best in the business. Uh, okay. Now you look very similar to the Jameson system. I, I don't see much, I'm looking at it, I don't see big differences. Probably. Uh, uh, great minds think alike so yeah uh, i wouldn't be surprised uh you can see that i'm got a very light and delicate hold on the pieces here though and i want to emphasize that now this is the carter product system which uh at the time of the book sales wise was selling more than anybody else it was uh, cheaper for one thing well yeah and uh it works essentially the same way uh it's a little bit finicky to set the gate to the right height you gotta undo a bunch of hex nuts uh hex bolts and uh get it all right but it's a while to set up the one-way system too so uh, it's it works as advertised very light touch you can see it's got a laser system above, as you can see. And all of it is pretty reasonably priced in my estimation and well made. I, I'm not terribly fond of their color choices for the anodizing, but uh, it is well made. Ernie, I have a question about sure. how far back the supports are. The same is true for the Sorby Steady Pro. It seems like it loses, uses a lot of the chisel length to support it. And you're also way back. Is that the way it does? You don't roll it up close to the piece? Well, I'm trying to illustrate this for a book. So uh, in reality, I would have that rest a lot closer to the opening in the bowl. And I would probably be standing in the center of this photograph with my left hand further forward on the shaft and my back hand barely resting on the handle just to give me a, an idea of where that handle is pointed and where it is in space. But again, uh, this is a, an illustration shot. So they tend to be uh, there. I've gone to the other side of the lathe, which I often do in this kind of work is that, uh, uh, and one reason I think a lathe is best placed in open space with no not against the wall because uh, it's very handy to go to the wrong side of it and well, i agree with that that's for sure yeah and there's it's on a scout which is the same lathe that john turns on it's a robust scout which is a great little workshop lathe and uh, again these are just a lot of these are outtakes uh ernie yeah, uh, the other one had a way to keep the uh, handle from rotating. Does this have a way to do that? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, it, it would be easy to rig something to do that, I suppose. But no, it's you basically you can slide the whole bar left or right anywhere you want it in this system, which I happen to like, but. Uh, but it, what he's talking about is actual rotation of the tool relative to the workpiece. Oh, it's, well, the, this will not rotate. There's a flat spot on all these boring bars that. Okay. Keep, so that's part of the game is the flat spot. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so that's the last slide. But okay. that gives you an idea of, of sort of how you set these things up and how they work. And if you'll notice right there uh, down here, I've got a compressed air hose 
which is extremely handy for this kind of work because you constantly have to clear chips. It's well, you want to be using that along with your dust collection hose too to blast them out of there and suck them out of your wind space. Exactly. It's uh, uh, this kind of turning is more akin to coal mining than it is uh, wood turning, uh, in my thoughts. <laughs> Well, that's a very good uh, intro to that to those gadgets. Anybody, any more comments or questions about that for Ernie? Yeah, what what hey. kind of uh, face protection are you wearing in those? Uh, it's the, the, the Uvex. Uvex, yeah, Uvex uh, shield, which they're about forty dollars on Amazon. Replacement shields are easy to get. Uh, they are fairly gunk resistant but uh, i i hate wearing a face shield personally uh i i wore that for the book uh and, because we made some decisions on when and where we would wear protection in the whole thing and i go into that in some detail in the safety chapter but uh i i find shields that i don't get a clear view of what i'm doing and i just hate being inside those things but in some cases they are a lifesaver and should be used i'm not saying never use them but i can't hardly see that it's terribly dangerous to turn a pen and that you need a face shield with them well, most of the to most turning you can also not have your head in the path of where the works going piece is going to go i mean you know be, be to one side or the other not not head on yes and uh, again, and starting the lathe up, standing out of the path of deflection, uh, so in case it's at too high a speed, it, it's just a habit you should form. And those kind of things. Also on spindles, generally the tool wrist throws them away from you and not towards yeah. you. Not at you, yep. Thank you. Anybody else? just bring up something? Uh, yes. As Anybody tried the Simon Hope uh, hollowing system? It's a UK tool company and they make a marvelous rig, which you can get through a distributor in Calgary who ships free to the US. And it's uh, the price is very competitive with other rigs and it's much more robust, robust than the Bosch's system or Yoder system, and it's very, very. Uh, I have one, and I think it's the. It's just absolutely fantastic. It's no what's vibration, it? very smooth. What's it called again? It's a Simon Hope. Could you put the vendor, uh, the the vendor address in the chat? Because uh, if they sell other Simon Simon Hope has some good products like a threading jig, and if they ship to the yeah, U.S. Yeah, I have the threading jig as well. It's yeah. it's marvelous. Yeah. Uh, the company is called Black Forest Wood Company, and uh, I can I can do something in the chat there. They're in Calgary, but like I say, they ship free to the U.S. on orders over three hundred dollars, which those things would cost. But I think uh, the hollowing jig is uh, maybe four hundred and sixty dollars or something Canadian, which is you know much less in U.S. dollars. Uh, so, um, but that's just a marvelous, marvelous. Just the quality of his, his all his tools is, is just fantastic. You can also see demonstrates these things on. A, he has a YouTube channel. Look, just look at for Simon Hope. He has a YouTube channel and he demonstrates these jigs and uh, demonstrates the the threading jig. Also, there's a chap called John Williams on uh, YouTube. He has a YouTube channel. And he made a rig similar to the, the first one you showed that Sorby does there. And I built one based on the plans he shows in the YouTube video. And it cost me virtually nothing. It probably cost me 75 bucks or something. And you, you can hollow 20 inches deep with the system he's put together. And like I say, it costs next to something. I went to a welding shop and guy charged me $20 over his lunch hour to put the, all the parts together who, after I had cut them myself. And for 
let's say 50 or 75 bucks, uh, I have a marvelous jig that just fits in your banjo. And uh, so if you go to John Williams YouTube channel, and he's got a whole bunch of good things on that channel. So I believe I've ordered Simon Hope tools through Oliver's is it in the UK, Oliver or something, if I remember right. But yeah. I used to order things directly from him and that with, with Brexit and the, the pandemic and everything else, he was having so much trouble getting things over here. He decided that just to deal through a distributor, unless this Oliver chap is willing to do it, but. Uh, I know I bought their thre his threading jig through them. Uh, Does the uh, threading jig uh, use a fly cutter in the uh, headstock and uh, a threaded rod to turn the piece against it. Yeah, but it's it's very very well built. It's uh, I can uh, I can send yes, pictures. You can buy to, different uh, threading rods to different um, pitch as well. All right, very similar to the one Chef Wear kit sells, but the Simon Hope is a little better built. It, uh, uh, Nova built about 40 units of those years ago. I was able to obtain one and they it worked that way. It would it was a kind of a low cost ornamental head and it worked as advertised. What's your take on these things, Mike? You've got a lot of experience with them. Yeah, you know, there's basically the two types. There's the Simon Hope Chefware that mounted the banjo. It has some pros and cons to that design, but it's a little bit cheaper versus the one like the old uh, Bonnie Klein or the current uh, Baxter Thread Threadmaster uh, out of fellow cells out of out of Tennessee that fits between the bedways. Um, the beauty of the banjo, you can adapt it very easily from one lathe to another by just adjusting the height because you can buy a post. Uh, different posts that will thread in and thread out, uh, whereas the others you've got to build up a platform to to do it on a larger lathe. Uh, what really works best is, is if you use two lathes. Do some turning on one lathe and you do the threading on midi lathe. Well, I was actually actually asking you about the hollowing tools, the gates. Oh, yeah. You know, I think there's there's pros and cons. I, I tried the Carter, didn't didn't like it. I I got. I made a Jameson style rig. Somebody gave me a really heavy D-ring support handle. Uh, I got a, a Jameson rig. I, I like it. It's got a very large footprint. Uh, the one that Ernie did not show are the ones, and there's only a, a few out there that, that have articulating arms that mm -hmm. mount generally on the banjo, and they tend to have a smaller footprint. I don't think they're probably as well suited for things deeper than I don't know, seven, eight, nine inches, but they are much easier to take off, set up, and store. That's the Trent Bosch system. The Trent Bosch, they, you, there's one by a fellow named Mons. Several of these people that have made them have, you know, aged out or passed on, and their business died with them. But uh, uh, Tim Yoder sells a low end one called uh, Elbow. Elbow, yeah, thank you. Uh, and it, that was one of the first ones that came out, but there's several of them like that. That makes Mark, more sense a, to me because a, I don't do a huge work. I, you know, I'm working on a scout, so I don't need one of these 20 inch deep things. You no, know, Vic Mark makes a really, really well built uh, articulated. That's what I use. And I, I, <clears throat> I do a lot of uh, birdhouse hollowing out of logs and I go in 10 inches, no problem. And the, the biggest thing is, is to use a big enough bar for the overhang. And the, but the articulator arm just holds the back end torque out of it. But uh, it's really well built. It has its own little post that swivels. And uh, but it's Vicmark. If you look on uh, Vicmark site, there, um, I really like it. It's simple, easy to put on, very flexible and very powerful. Just have to put a big bar in it. I got a bigger bar than normal. I think I'm running a three quarter inch, and I'm going to go up to a one inch bar with a three quarter inch uh, step down. The biggest thing is the the bigger the bar that's hanging over the the, the, the tool rest, that's where your vibration comes from. The stiffness of a round bar uh, in, uh, increases by a power of four as the diameter increases. Right. 
going yeah. from a half to an inch will give you like 16 times stiffer bar. Uh, it, so it's a, it's an easy one to noodle out that just bigger is better. <laughs> yeah. Well, it yeah. strikes me in these systems, if you since you're trapping the bar anyhow, you could make a tool using a square bar uh, and a metal worker cutter set in the end of it. It'll be a lot easier to get that cutter mounted in a square bar than in a round one. John, I have a I have a, a picture pulled up on my computer doing exactly that. Um, if if I could have the floor, I could do a share screen and uh, give it a try. Well, first it, off, it, I wanted to uh, say that on Tuesday night your audio video um, came through perfectly. Good. Uh, here's the system I built about 20 years ago. And I used one inch square tubing. I bought a length at a Princess Auto. It's sort of like uh, Grizzly, I guess. Uh, anyway, so I, this is about, I don't know, 20 inches long. This is about six inches across. This is probably 18 to 20 inches. The three quarter inch bar fits inside perfectly. Braised the nut on top here to be able to provide a locking bolt. And I made my, these are just cold rolled steel. Uh, they look a little light for the application. Pardon me? They look a little thin for the application. Um, it works fine. I, the urn I worked on last, I, I'm in 10 inches. And you could easily adapt, make a one inch adapter a year. I've never got around to doing it. I, I honestly haven't done that much with it, but it, it has worked fine. Uh, I've done okay. a couple of burns. I've done several small, you know, hollow forms. Uh, John, was your comment about being light on the size of the steel rod on the gate? Yeah. No, that doesn't take a whole lot. Uh, mine, Mine and the one I modeled mine after were made out of wood uh, with a couple of bolts to, to adjust the gate. It, You know, you get that far out and it's just stopping it. It just doesn't have to be real robust on the back end. It's the just front the end that's it. working and work. The See, torque is arrested perfectly here. You just, you can literally control it with two fingers. Okay, well, that's very encouraging to me. I was thinking these things needed to be much stouter and sturdier than I'd be able to build myself. But what I'm seeing here and what we just saw a while ago, this is, I remember back in the 70s thinking, hey, there should be some kind of a way of stabilizing these things so we could hollow. And here they are all invented. Um, it seems to me it's quite quite makeable in your own shop if you're a My brother-in-law welded this and braised. We did this over Christmas one time, uh, the great. But I bought myself a little wire welder to fix real estate signs for our family real estate business about three years ago. And it would work perfectly on something like this. That, that was less than 200 bucks. So you could buy a welder and have some fun with it, fixing your garden tools and whatnot. I can uh, think of a couple <laughs> of ways to... The savings of buying a, a manufactured system. So I'll stop well, it here. It seems Thank to me you. that could also be a slab of wood in there with a tool sticking out of the end. Yeah. You know, one of the problems with Trent Process system is you're locked in. If you have his 5 8 inch uh, stabilizer, that's the biggest bar you can put in his. You have to have a three quarter one to put the three quarter in. I guess you could adapt them by, adapt by them. but that means you also still have that same weak spot, but at least you'd have a heavier bar hanging over the edge. So. I guess I bought the big one and it comes with the adapters to do all the small sizes all in one. So, yeah. uh, yeah. Yeah, I have the I have the five eighth and I quickly went to that bar, but I may do I may go find a machinist to give me a one inch or a three quarter inch and just turn it down so I can stick it in his unit. I like his okay. unit. So. Yeah. One thing I might add is I saw a Lyle Jameson demo again about twenty years ago and I bought his uh, cutter holder, which was a three eighth bar and a and a bent version of it. And then later, when the hunter came out, he came out with the number one adapter. I absolutely love that. And I take that little cutter that's mounted on the 3 uh, uh square bar and just have it in a handheld tool I made with cold rolled steel as well. Perfectly for boxes and, and small stuff. Doing Christmas ornaments, whatever. Okay. It, it's just a great combination. We burned off half the hour here on, on these rigs, so I'm going to suggest we move on unless somebody's got a burning desire to say something more. Okay. 
I'm going to go to the top of the screen now. Um, Gerald, what do you have today? You're muted, buddy. All right. Now I'm busy. Let me see what I can come up with here. I think that I have, as soon as it, why won't it share? Okay. Uh, a friend called me the other day, well, it's been a month or so ago now, and he needed uh, some uh, balusters turned and a few other things, null posts. And my lathe is 42 inches long. Well, his null posts were longer than my lathe, so I decided, well, I'm going to make an extension. So this is the beginning of an extension. Now, I recycle everything. Anything that uh, shows up uh, around here that... Uh, I think I can reuse sometime, I will. So not only the angle irons you saw there on the sawhorse, but also my son and I tore down a building and it was all made of, of uh, two inch oak uh, for the rafters and joists and all. So uh, saved all the two inch oak and I machined them down, planed them. And this is my uh, uh, center part. Uh, to sort of replicate the, the lathe that I have. And as you can see, they're used. Made my bedways out of the angle iron, attached them then to the oak and my sawhorse design. Everything assembled. And there it is in place on the end of the grizzly. <laughs> Uh, now, you're not planning to do a lot of adjusting of the tailstock on that. You're going to park it and uh, pretty much leave it there. So it doesn't have to slide slick on the, on the angle. It doesn't, it doesn't have to go slick, but it does move pretty well. It's not polished. It's not, uh, you know, uh, ground like the bed lathe of, a, of the uh, lathe itself, but it does move pretty easy. Uh, baby powder helps a lot. And the tool rest goes over there pretty well, too? I have not tried the tool rest on it yet. Okay, uh, you're going to need to finish that newel post. Uh, well, the newel, if we go one more slide, they, they had turned these newel posts, somebody had, and they were supposed to be three inches square. Well, they took uh, four inch square stock and didn't bother to, to plane it down to three, and then they turned them and and they're so screwed up and I hope I'm going to be able to salvage them. But you can see uh, how far out the, the tool or the uh, tailstock has to set right. to turn those posts. Okay, that was the final slide. So I'll stop my share. Has anybody else done that kind of extension on their lathe? I know I did one time many years ago. Uh, it works pretty good. You, and you can just make a platform where you're going to put the tool rest. You don't have to connect it really. Actually, uh, mine's connected. Now, Mark uh, wanted to turn some large posts. I, what were yours, Mark? Uh, about eight, eight foot, but you cut them down into pieces, smaller pieces. And uh, he used uh, zip ties. And we took two lathe beds and uh, he zip tied the two lathe beds together and made a very long lathe. I saw one fellow who had mounted a a piece of a lathe ways on the wall of his shop at the right height that he could park a tool rest on, and then he'd move oh. the lathe to, oh. <laughs> to get the length that he wanted. That worked pretty good for a once in a while thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that was my contribution for the day, so. Okay, well, thank you very much. Good, good, good shot. Uh, Mike Peace, how about you? Uh, mine'll be pretty quick. Uh, I, I had, I've got three sets of Sorby hand thread chasers. And they've got an awkward handle that's about three or four inches longer than it needs to be. It's a little thicker. So I, I got a, I made a pair of handles in a more traditional design that are much more ergonomic and, and attractive and, and appropriately sized for. And I've got uh, two more sets of thread chasers I need to retrofit the handles to. And then the other item. Those are nice handles. Yeah. Uh, it, it's they're very elegant looking it's a very old style and then here's an ornament i made it's got a secret compartment in it thread threaded little acorn box that turn into an ornament 
And that's uh, holly, cool. holly on the bottom, which is chaseable, and uh, Osage orange on the top, which is uh, does generally fairly well with uh, hand hand chaser. So go back to those tool handles if you would, and bring them up again. All right, very nice shapes. I, I'm I'm making ice cream scoops. So I'm going to copy that. I think if I was going to do a, uh, any other small tools, I think I would go to this style. Uh, a point tool, for example, uh, uh, a very small uh, thread chaser, or anything that, that would require a small handle. This is the style I think I'd go with. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice design. Thank you. Any comments or questions for Mike? Or for Gerald, for that matter. Did you you use chatter work on the acorn lid there? Uh, uh, what chatter tools you use? I did. I used the uh, Sorby Micro System. Crown has one that's uh, generally comparable that looks to be the same. And frankly, the uh, the crown is where I model the handle after. Let me pull that one out. That chatter. That, it, it it's really wasn't a chatter tool. It was a uh, it was this tool right here. Let me spotlight you again. Let me get back to the speaker view. With the with the uh, texturing texturing wheel, which comes to a, a point on both sides. But that's the handle shape that I modeled those others after. All right. More questions or comments? Okay, thank you, Mike. How about you, Bruce? Okay, I've um, done what I keep saying I'm not going to do again, which is go back to turning resin. And, uh, every time I do it, I say, why am I doing this? And uh, I guess I'm a polymer chemist. I can't get away from it. It's just what I did for so many years. So um, a lot of times I've been making things that have kind of uh, rivers running through it in pieces. But I wanted to try something with symmetry, which um, makes it a little more interesting. So you'll see I put a lot of circles on this piece trying to get the two cutouts to be fairly symmetrical and kind of work on negative space, kind of have a, a flask or a jar or a jug or whatever you want to think about it in the center of this piece. Um, and to do that, I went to, um, making my own mold and gluing the pieces down so I could get really good grain alignment on this piece of hackberry. I don't know if anyone else has turned hackberry, but it really turns beautifully and it has a really nice grain structure and uh, tools quite well. Um, I, I The piece you saw in the first one was just bandsaw and I do try and sand it a little bit to, to smooth out curves, but I really don't want it to be perfect. I think the idea of it flowing through it in somewhat an imperfect way adds a little bit to the piece. Um, this this mold ha is made from a concrete form. Uh, I think others have done that. It wasn't my invention. They do have a, a slight plastic film on the inside, which does pretty well with resin. I do find occasionally they do leak, particularly at the seams, and I tend to run a little hot hot melt glue up the seam uh, on the inside before I use these. Uh, and then I glue in a piece of MDF on the bottom and I glue that on both the inside and the outside to try and get a pretty good seal. But I'm about a 95% on this. Every now and then I get one that makes me very crazy as the resin starts to leak out. And when you use uh, very slow curing resin, that problem can go on for a very long time. That's this true. resin takes uh, two, three days to cure. So uh, it's, it's interesting. Anyway, I filled it up with a mix of colors. I find I use a lot of mica powders and some of them I think have different densities and it's interesting as you mix them they tend to to, to uh, generate their own kind of patterns without touching it. Um, and I think in this case the red seems to be a heavier particle than the, the gold that I use and it comes out a little differently depending on uh, on how you do it but it's fun you watch it as it cures and it starts generating a little bit of heat, you can see the things move around all by themselves, which is something I can't really reproduce well, but it's something that I'm aware of. <laughs> so anyway, this is what the piece came out as. Um, I, I worked pretty hard to get the, the transition down to the bottom of the uh, 
platter as, as even as I can. And I find that's a little tricky with with uh, resin when it's cutting at a very different rate and style than the the the, uh, the wood does. What's and I also try pretty hard not to have these just thick things. I like to have the piece kind of on the thin side to really show through. You get a little more translucence, but also when you pick it up, it's not a, a 10 pound piece of, of, uh, uh, of wood. So anyway, that's, that's my uh, adventure. How permanent do you think the bond is between the plastic and the wood there? I mean, that's, there's, there's not, that's not bridged by solid wood anywhere. No, it's not. It's three individual pieces, um, but that is epoxy and it goes right in. I do not find sand when I made the uh, actual pieces here. This is sanded to about 80. It leaves it fairly porous and uh, gives you a pretty nice uh, amount to, uh, to, to get in there. I don't find it moves with time. Uh, and uh, so far, at least pieces I've had a year or two, I don't see any real uh, issue with that. Now I'm not trying to eat off this plate, but uh, I think otherwise it's it's pretty sturdy. Bruce, I think I remember you don't seal your wood either. So the epoxy would go in the pores of the wood that would lock it in, right? That's correct. I don't put in a pre-seal process at all. No. I'll have to, I'll have to try hey. that. Hey, what, what chisels are you using to turn that? I'm asking because I'm turning a big vessel right now, epoxy, and I'm getting one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm fighting it. <laughs> no, that's a great question. And um, there's a couple of things about turning epoxy, particularly with wood. The number one is you can't be too greedy about how fast you want to go. Uh, and second, carbide tools work better in many cases than uh, your standard wood turning tools. So if I try to take a bowl gouge to this, it just does not work real well at all. Um, I usually start with... Um, an easy wood tools finisher tool, um, which is the round cutter, but I find that that absolutely chips the, the epoxy out. It does not cleanly take it out the way um, uh, you would like to do it. But if I have a lot to move, I'll do that first. And the problem is I'm gonna clean that up for days because it's gonna be in every corner of the shop. Uh, it goes a long way. But what I have found that works amazingly well is this tool from it's called Simple Wood Turning Tools, and they make a resin cutter, which is a circular cutter that when it's turned 30 degrees on its side, which made me think when we were all talking about hollowing rigs, the reason I don't want a square cutter is I often want to angle my cutter uh, quite a bit, particularly in these particular type of cutters, and it makes it much less aggressive when it's turned about 30 uh, degrees and it cuts quite cleanly. Uh, you get the, the fine ribbons off, not the, the chips, and you know that that makes a big difference. And then finally, um, I will take a Cindy Drozda heavy duty um, negative rake scraper very lightly that's made out of the Thompson steel. And I find that that cuts quite cleanly to clean up any of the uh, slight imperfections you get out of that. And when I'm, I'm done with that tool, um, I can start with a pretty fine piece of sandpaper is to go from there, um, uh, probably 240 or, or better. Um, but I, I find that that combination of tools, and it's taken me a while to get to that combination of tools, works best on this kind of, uh, of resin uh, wood combination. Have you tried uh, Easy Wood Tools actually makes a negative rake carbide cutter for their system that's for turning resin. I and don't believe I've tried that particular cutter, but the standard cutter, I guess, that they have in the in the finisher is, is not as good as, as this one that I've been using. It is uh, a different style. The cutter in the uh, simple wood turning, it's, it's a round cutter that you're cutting off the edge of. It's a very different style cutter than the easy wood tools. It's, it's kind of more like the... Um, um, the other the other system that's available with one way that the name just goes right out of my head, but um, I think other folks have mentioned it. But anyway, Bruce, I have not used that one. Bruce, uh, yeah, I I use I use a round cutter to try to shape, but I worry because man, that's making shards. Not if you look in the background now, you see I'm turning with a negative rake scraper there, and I'm just getting those ribbons all over the place. 
But I worry with the carbide cutter round without a negative, I get a lot of chipping in it. I worry that I get one that's going to go where I don't want it to go. So I go to the negative rake, but boy, it's slow go. And yeah, you just go on and on and on and you you fill the shop with ribbons. So. Yeah, check out this tool though. It, it, it's specifically designed for resin. I think it's coded AR something. Okay. Uh, from simple wood turning tools, and it's not horribly expensive, uh, and the cutters are re relatively reasonable as well. But I've been using those for a while, and, and for this kind of work, I find them really, really good. Have you tried cup cutters at all, like they make from Hunter? They and would then pair it up at an angle. Oh, Hunter was the name I was trying to think of. This style of cutter is similar. It's kind of that shape. It is kind of a cup, I think. Um, yeah, you have to look at it. Um, yeah. Okay. So I've got something that I've been using for cutting uh, the resins and that, and that's um, it's the Jimmy Clues Mate Tools. I don't know if you're familiar with them at all. He's got a set of about six different blades, from angles and that, and it's for hollowing and that. But it's it's a it's a round carbide cutter on a 30 degree rake, and I've had great success with that cutting resin. Might be something for you to look into. All right, thank you. I think clearly it's. Uh... Something you have to play with. <laughs> yeah. Fine words. Okay. I'm going to move us along. Um, Kai, do you, you only got about 10 minutes left or 12 minutes. Can you do your show in that time or shall I, do you want to come back next week and I'll go on to these other guys? Yeah, maybe it's better to come back next week than there might be some more time if there are questions. Yeah, I don't want to short you off. I know you've got a good show for us. So I'm going to go to these other guys and we'll, we'll have you, you, you re, uh, you'll be here next week, I hope. Okay. Good, thanks. Uh, uh, Dave Belial, you want to try it? Uh, yeah, I, uh, since Mike showed uh, one of his pieces, uh, uh, I have a tiny acorn. It's about an, uh, maybe an inch to an inch and an eighth. Um, and it's an ornament for the tree, but there's a tiny note on there that says uh, it's also a top. So I'm giving these to people in the neighborhood that have small children for their tree. Are they hollow? Uh, no, no. It's like I said. It's only an inch, uh, uh, inch in diameter, inch and a quarter, uh, eighth in diameter. So no, I used uh, some uh, ebony for the top of it uh, to darken it. Uh, get that to stop shaking. I used some ebony on the top. I used a decorating elf uh, to get the texture on it, and you know, the bath, you can knock them out pretty quickly and. Makes a nice little ornament. So it's a one piece. All one piece. One piece. Okay. Questions for Thank Dave? You. Questions for Dave? No. Okay. Barry, you're on. Hey, mine is a, my question is a question. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, about a year ago, I bought a couple slabs of what was supposed to be Osage orange. And I just began to turn it, and it does turn nicely, but you know, it seems like mulberry to me. Does anybody have any uh, thoughts out there on how to differenti differentiate looks, Osage orange from mulberry? Looks a lot like mulberry to me, but I'm looking Berry. at it. Yeah, Osage would be much, much heavier than mulberry. One of the first posts I ever made on the Internet was so I got some mulberry from my brother-in-law's woodpile. And uh, anyway, that's where I started studying the two. And I actually found an Osage. We were in an area that was being developed and they had just clawed a couple of Osage orange trees out from a neighbor's farm. And I still have pieces of it in my stack. But Osage would be much, much heavier and denser than the mulberry. The color is somewhat similar, but no question, the mulberry is probably at least a third heavier. They, they do oh, no. look Osage a lot is... alike, actually. And uh, when they're wet, of course, it's hard to tell uh, one's heavier than the other. But uh, mulberry, uh, I don't know if it's as easy to turn. I, I don't know a good answer to your question, Barry, except that they are really similar. And uh, you're, you're, there is a lot of mulberry in our area in Maryland. Uh, I know I once actually very recently went to get a piece. I thought it was Osage orange and it was mulberry. So... Well, mulberry, mulberry turns mulberry. very well. I've, I've turned quite a lot of it. It's a lovely turning wood, and it's very pretty, uh, very pretty color as it uh, 
it, it darkens as it sits out. It's very so it photosensitive and darkens very quickly under light. In fact, you can put a old time black and white negative on it and put it out in the sun and it'll leave the picture in the wood. Well, it's you would that, Osage same stays yellow a lot longer. Yeah, I, I um, this stuff has a, it does, it turns with a very silky surface. Uh, it turns nicely on the resulting wood before you ever sand, has a very silky feel to it, almost like there was a talcum powder put on it or something. But it has a grain structure that reminds me a lot of uh, uh, ash, frankly. I know it's not ash, but. I think it's, I, I, that sounds an awful lot like mulberry is what you're holding in your hand there. Is uh, they are in the same family from doing online research. They are, they're in the same family of tree. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, right next door to each other. And it, it must be a lot of people confused because there were a lot of questions on wood turners or woodworker sites on uh, does anybody have experience with differentiating them? We uh, went on a wood gathering. Uh, open grain. We went on a wood gathering expedition one time down in the southern part of the county. The dude thought he had walnut, but he actually had mulberry when we got there. So it can be confusing like that as well. In, in other words, once the tree has been cut and sits out in the sun a little bit, the end grain will turn quite dark like walnut. Yeah. Uh, the there, there's a no sage pear I made a long time ago, and the colors are very similar. I actually have a picture I can, couldn't find it on, I, on this computer of a bowl I did for my sister in law, and in three years, it's incredible. There's you can't make a stain that'll give you the color that the sunlight will with uh, with mulberry. It's just a gorgeous color. Yeah, mulberry changes faster I think than osage, and I have a piece of Osage buried in some epoxy because uh, my theory is if you filter the UV, it might not change. I have it poured now a year, I haven't turned it yet and it's still yellow, so I don't know. But It is UV that causes it to change, I believe, not oxygen, UV, I believe. Well, if that's the case, then I think buried in epoxy, which is usually UV inhibited, uh, it'll last yellow a long time. I should get it out and turn it. I was gonna make a flask top for it, stopper for it, but I didn't do it yet, so. Well, the the, uh, the board, the plank, actually was a three inch thick slab, uh, about 15 inches wide, and then I got like two, three foot lengths. And the person was a wood selling guy, and he told me it was Osage Orange. Uh, and it was, the surfaces were all, probably sitting in the air for about four years in a barn and they did not have the dark color of, I have a small live edge bowl that I made from mulberry and it turned quite dark as it dried. Uh, not unlike the pear that I, I just saw on the screen. Uh, this stuff here turns more of like a, uh, like a raw chestnut color. Mm. I'd go by the density. If it's real heavy, it probably is Osage. You can, if it, it's about the same as red oak. Yeah. Let's say, you know, 50 pounds per cubic foot, something like that. I don't know where Osage orange falls in that matter. If you have them next to each other, you'll know right away. If you lift the one, you'll say, oh, Osage orange, my back just went out. So, well, is there a way to chemically accelerate the, uh, aging process uv you could fume it with ammonia i'm sorry fume it with ammonia and that's a different reaction if john's right reaction. it's uv sensitive you just need a lamp above it and uh that would ammonia be fuming. ammonia fuming works on oak because it's working on the tannic acid i don't know if this wood is heavy in tannic acid or not i'll give that a try i have used tannic acid on on red oak and uh some other tannic uh, some other woods that react to it. This I, I just, have tried. I just put it out in the sun would be your best yeah. player. It'll turn over real fast. Um, I should say since Barry's on screen that uh, on Tuesday night, Barry was uh, elected president of the Lancaster Club. Uh, congratulations, Barry. 
And Thank you. That means he's moving on from secretary. So Tom Wenzel uh, has taken over as secretary. Tom is not usually on coffee hour. Tom lives up in Lidditz and he has a business uh, restoring pre-1940 blues guitars. You couldn't get more esoteric than that. He took up wood turning so he could make turning pe tuning pegs. <laughs> so we also uh, in the club have a, a fellow named John Ziegler who's taking over the club meeting um, AV operation role from me. So all I'm going to be able to be doing is uh, coffee hour instead of doing the club meetings as well. So that's a very exciting prospect to me. Um, I was interested in what you said, Michael, about the audio video from Tuesday night. Can you say more? Well, I just felt that it came through really, really well. When Barry was doing his demo, his audio was absolutely perfect. Now, when Mike was doing his introduction, his pickup wasn't quite as good. Maybe it's just the voice tone, whatever. But the the video as well was really really good both both were were excellent i thought the homogenization of the meeting was about as good as you could get it you know from a standpoint i'm looking from zoom land and you're in the in the uh the shop there at lancaster it was really i i felt well, really at home in it with just a really good presentation well, that's nice to hear because that. we put an awful lot of attention on getting control of audio levels and, and knowing what we're doing there with audio. And the microphones we're using almost exclusively now are those little $40 puck mics, the CM1000 yeah. puck mic. There's four of them around the room and there's one that's right near the lathe up front. And so if the person at the lathe projects just a little bit, it picks it up really, really well. Yeah, yeah. The other we innovation that we're going to... We're hoping to in January. We've got our hardware now, but... Uh, uh, Scott is in the process of working over the holidays and that to get it running at home. And then we'll, we just don't have access to our auditorium or meeting space to, to play. So you have to play at the meeting and it's pretty tough. Yeah, we're lucky that we can access the space anytime and leave the gear set up. And the other innovation we're about to add to it is one more monitor. We figured out a way to show the gallery view to the, the meeting leader so that uh, we ran into this on Tuesday night. We wanted to have a vote. We got 15 people in the room and 25 on screen, and we need a, we want to count the votes. Uh, we need to, the moderator needs to see the gallery view. Uh, we just figured out a way to do that as well. So we're going to be adding one more monitor for so we and I actually have the idea that that monitor ought to be large on the wall. So the gallery, the uh, yeah. Zoom players have a presence in the meeting room. And one of the windows ought to be prominently on the room. So the room people in the room also have a presence in the Zoom array. Yeah, so that's, that's the real it. problem we're up against is having an actual feeling of fellowship between the two sides of the meeting. Yeah, yeah. The TV oh. lift system that uh, Maurice put together is, is phenomenal and was not costly. Uh, you know, the whole thing was probably seven or 800 bucks with the shop cabinet and the lift from Amazon. Uh, but having a situation where you got to move your equipment in it creates its own set of problems. That that would be a good point to have in an in session in January of the hybrid group. You're, yeah, you're, that would be a good thing time. to bring up there. Uh, it's yeah. been discussed a bit. I mean, I made the wheelchair, uh, the uh, travel yeah. you know, invalid chair version. Um, that seemed to me to be a pretty good platform for moving a lot of gear and keeping it in order as well. And other things like that, purpose-built carts with storage and stowage for all the gear and connect stuff can stay wired together. You just got to deploy the cameras and plug it all in. Um, I'm going to end now, right, right now, but Barry, you, you got something else you want to say? I was uh, asking if anybody had ever tried using heat shrink plastic wrap, like uh, to envelop an object with, they make some holiday patterns in, uh, in heat shrink, and I was considering, like, you know, turning ornaments out of basswood or something cheap and putting heat shrink, which already has the pattern on it. And I didn't know if anybody had ever used uh, heat shrinkable material on a finished item not other me. than a shop handle. Yeah, not me. Back to gallery view. Anybody? Okay. Well, we're just gonna say can I add one thing for Barry quickly? I have both Mulberry and Osage. I'll try and do some end grain shots and, and email them to you. Uh, comparison. You, if you're aware of Woodley's book on, on woods, eh? 
and he he's a big proponent of using end grain. And yeah, it is right. Ten ten power lens looking at end grain, you can tell almost all woods apart. But you got to know yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, I Michael, I think if you turn it, you'll know right away. I think Osage will turn a lot different than Mulberry. Oh, yeah. I have both of them here, and yeah. I never turned Osage orange, as far as I know. Uh, this did turn nicely, but it's a coarser green structure that I imagined uh, yep. Osage orange would be. It's very coarse, but not open it's, green, just coarse. So. It's dry and hard. It's 10, it's 11 o'clock. We're going to pull the plug on you guys. Thank you all for a, a, another excellently entertaining and in endlessly interesting morning about all about wood turning. See you all next week. Yeah, thanks, John. Another good one, John. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, thanks, John. Guys. Bye now. Thank, Thank you, you all, John. John. See you. Thank see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank God for wood.